Hi there, I'm the Reverend Danny Crosby, a Unitarian minister serving congregations in Altingham and in Ermston in the northwest of England. And I offer this devotion as a balm for the heart, for the mind, for the spirit, and for the soul. And it's titled Empathy, Guilt, Shame. They are not exactly the same. If you heard my um, last uh, devotion, you will have heard me talking about a conversation I had with colleagues at uh, Ministry in the Making, time away with some upcoming student ministers and, and, uh, and new ministers. Now, I'm not going to repeat all that here. I just want to talk about one aspect of the conversation that came up, something that has, may well have been my primary motivation of my ministry, really. You see, I talk with lots of people. Well, actually, I listen in conversation more with lots of people. They do most of the talking. The ears are the most important role in ministry. It's my life in many ways, this conversation, onward and onward. Now, one thing I often notice is that so many people struggle with or have struggled in the past with feelings of guilt and or shame. And the feelings of shame, I've noticed, are often without any cause at all, actually. Some of the guilt, there may be reasons, but the shame, no. It seems, the shame seems to come from some place deep within them. And I know that these are feelings that are often preyed upon with, from so many, so many sources. But prey upon our feelings of shame, really. People make money off it, really, or gain power. Or people offer easy alternatives, a simple way out of these feelings. And it's not that simple. There's if this feeling of wrongness that you have, that we offer a cure that can easily be given to you, provided you give us some money, of course. There's lots of money to be made here. But the truth is, we're not human beings, are not something that needs to be fixed. Yes, there is healing from aspects of our lives. But we're not something that's absolutely broken at the core of our being that needs to be fixed, altered on a deep level, on a cellular level, if you like. There is healing required, actually. And most of us wander on limping along like Chiron did to the wounded healer. We carry our wounds with us and admit some may heal in some ways and some are just part of who we are. But I do not believe that we are, at the core of our being, fundamentally flawed in our nature. Yes, we do wrong, but we're not wrong at the core of our being. We should feel appropriate guilt for things that we do wrong, but not a shame. And shame is something that comes from a sense that we are wrong, not that we do wrong. And there's a significant difference. And therein lies the difference between guilt and shame. Actually, guilt comes from things that we do wrong. Shame comes from a sense that we actually are wrong. And they can manifest similarly, but they are very, very different. My kind of dream, if I had one, is to make a space where people can come without shame and explore these feelings in an open and safe environment and perhaps to find a way to bring some healing. A space where we can come to terms with ourselves and put right what we can put right and accept what we can't, both within ourselves, our communities and our world, to come into right relationship again, if you like, to forgive ourselves, to forgive one another, and to begin again in love. I'm sure all of us have done things we wish we hadn't, or said things we wish we hadn't, or acted when perhaps we should have acted, or said things we, when we should have said something, but remained silent. I was talking about this with a friend the other day as we were out walking the dogs, playing in the park. Our dogs, the dogs just having such joy together. And we chatted about serious and sometimes silly things. But we both shared about times when we remained silent, actually, when we should have spoken up. And we discussed how this made us feel. There was a sense of appropriate guilt, actually. And I think this feeling of appropriate guilt for, for failing, for not failing to speak up when we should have done, is an appropriate feeling. It comes from the conscience. It comes from having a conscience, I guess. If you didn't have a conscience, you wouldn't feel that, that sense of guilt. So it's a good thing, 
in and of itself. That conscience is a seed of the divine, I would say. And it's there for all of us to tap into. It's a healthy feeling, something that we should try to develop, something we should attempt to live from, something we need to work on and develop. If we're going to work on some aspect of human your humanity, work on engaging with that conscience and bringing that conscience into your life, I guess. If there's one thing a human being needs to work on, it's that, I guess. Because empathy grows from this place, which is a vital aspect of our humanity. Empathy and guilt, I would say, are vital human emotions, provided they grow alive within us and don't start to destroy us, I guess. Because we have them for important, for vital reasons, actually. We have them for good reasons, and we need to develop these reasons in order to live the good life, the virtue, the life of virtue. And these feelings come as a response to life itself, from our lives and the lives of others. It's a stimulus response, I guess. Shame, though, is very, very different. It is, it's a negative feeling. And instead of being a response to life itself, it seems to come as a rejection to life itself. It's a response that comes from a constriction, if you like. Now, where that really comes from, I'm not sure. But it seems to be a, re a rejection of that divine love within all of us. And it's incredibly destructive. Now, guilt's a common feeling for most ministers. We rarely feel we are doing a good enough job, it seems. We all wish we could do more. I feel guilt around the sufferings of others, actually. It's a real pang at times. Now... The healthy form of this feeling manifests within me as empathy, something that is vital to the role, actually. But unhealthy forms come from manifest as shame, which is never good for anybody. I do wish I could do more for those who suffer. I feel guilt for their suffering and the suffering of their loved ones. I feel it also around friends and family too, particularly old friends, as I don't have time for so much. I can feel it sometimes when I'm in a joyful state, when I feel the joy of simply being alive when I see others suffering and struggling. There's some part of me that doesn't quite feel right. I also experience what you might call survivor's guilt from all kinds of aspects of my life, particularly recovery when I see dear friends and fellows struggling and or dying. And sometimes I feel guilt for feeling guilt, if you like, when I should be experiencing the joy of life. Crazy, isn't it, do you think? But it's very human. I don't think I'm alone in these feelings, quite the opposite. And there are positives. It does suggest, you know, to have these kind of feelings that I think come from empathy. Proves I'm not a psychopath. So that's good news, isn't it? I'm very pleased about that, actually. I don't feel guilt about that, although... There you go. I am a human being who experiences the same emotions as most of us do too. Thank God for that. All these feelings come from a sense of deep empathy, actually. A vital aspect of healthy humanity, which can be used in a positive and active way. But sometimes it can become problematic if the feelings overwhelm or they tap into... You know, they get, or they become shame-based, I guess, or they tap into shame somehow, or shame gets a hold of them. For a shame will, will, will lead to a person to shrink away from the pain of others, to, to become unsympathetic, to have no empathy, really. Empathy and healthy guilt are what allow us to connect to the suffering of others, to not have them, I can't imagine what kind of hell that must be. But sometimes it can, we can become overwhelmed and shame can then get a grip on that. Some unresolved aspect of our humanity, which we all need time and space to, to come to terms with, to heal from, I guess. Feelings of guilt come in many, many forms. Some are healthy and helpful and some are not. Some are decidedly unhelpful. To feel remorse after saying or doing the wrong thing is a healthy feeling. To not feel it is unhealthy. But it compels us to do what we can to put right what was wrong, to amend, to atone, if you like. 
That said, if the feeling lingers, even after putting right the wrong, if we dwell and beat ourselves up for some unskillful word or action, the feeling then is not healthy, it's not empathy, it's not guilt, it's shame. Something that grows from a very different place. Something wholly destructive and life denying, life destroying even. So the key is where the feeling comes from. Does it come as a result of our actions, our thoughts, our words or our deeds or lack of them? Or is it a feeling that comes from some other place and almost dis dictates our thoughts, feelings, words and actions? Who knows? One is guilt and one is shame. Where does this sense that there's something wrong with us, this sense of shame, where does that grow from? And why does it control so many lives, drive so many lives? Now, some within our Western culture will put that down to our that the shame comes from our Judeo-Christian heritage, this kind of negative guilt. It's a, that it's, this is the core of our culture, so this is where it comes from. Even in these secular times where people may reject spiritual things, they still seem held down by these cultural feelings. Now, sometimes people from different religious backgrounds may argue about which one of them feels the most guilt. It's a common thing, isn't it? But it's interesting, you know. Although the Judeo-Christian tradition does seem seeped in guilt, when you read the Bible, both the Hebrew scriptures and the and the, the gospel accounts and the New New Testament, if you like, there's no real reference to guilt as we commonly understand guilt to be found. To feel guilty in that sense at the core of our being, it's not really there. Although people seem to think that they can find it there. If you look for it, you will find it. It's just truth in any life. I remember a few years ago reading this wonderful book, which has been the core book, really, in my, my grief work over this. It's a beautiful book, read, read, written by a, a wonderful, beautiful, really, um, retired Unitarian Universalist minister who I met once, actually, when he came to England, who wrote this wonderful book called Nothing Gold Can Stay, The Colours of Grief. And it's his reflection on his own ministry and his own experiences with grief and his own struggles with grief both personally and professionally and all the different colors the different types of grief i stole the second half of the title to form my grief group the colors of grief our shared experience of love and loss it, I, say I stole it it inspired me i'm not going to feel guilty about that because it's inspired by him really and his work and my own experiences of course but here's what Mark said. It's really interesting what Mark wrote, and he's a, he's a scholar too. He wrote, I confess to being surprised that the word guilt itself, as in the feeling of guilt, is not found any place in either the Jewish or the Christian testaments. Not once. The few times the English word can be found in more antique translations it refers only to the kind of guilty the courts speak about, which is not a feeling so much as a legal category. And then he continues. I am convinced that families of origin, cultural and ethnic patterns and categorical realities play a far greater role in how much guilt we feel than does religion. I certainly have known folks raised without religion of any kind, including the shopping mall spirituality created by cultus consumerism, who have struggled with guilt as much as anyone raised in any particular denomination of religion, Western or Eastern. What a great, what a great phrase, cultus consumerism. Let me bow down and worship thee. <laughs> How many people do? We don't observe Sabbath anymore. People go and worship at other temples, don't they? These deeper feelings of guilt, if you like, the, the, the ones that we kind of talk about nowadays, 
and to come from some place within us. And when it's in appropriate proportion, when it's an appropriate sort of empathetic response to an event, that's a good thing. But it connects us to one another and it connects us to life and it keeps us humble and therefore human and saves us from the dangers of destructive hubris. Those that suffer hubris do not feel guilt. They think they're beyond all that, all these human concerns. They just don't feel it. Danger. Anybody who doesn't is a concern to me and certainly don't let them have any power. So those feelings of, of guilt as in a response to life when we fall short or fail is a function of our conscience. It comes from that place deep within us, what you might call the soul, if you like, that aspect of God in each and every one of us. There's not the Quaker, that of God within each of us that the Quakers and the Hindus and so many others recognise. And I think this enlightened conscience, if you like, is, is key to my understanding of my own Unitarian faith. This living revelation that's, that's an aspect of humanity that can be tapped into and can grow. If I tap into it and allow it to lead me, who knows where it can lead? It will give me the strength and the courage to do things I didn't think it was possible. And when I do see this in others, I feel a deeper empathy for them too, even for their struggles and their suffering and their shortcomings. You see, in opening myself to the divine spark within, I open myself to that same spark in everyone and everything. It's the key to my understanding of religion and my attempts to live my life in the company of others and through which I attempt to shape an ideal that I strive for. But I never will attain, I realise. But I aim high, and so I fall short of the mark. Which means I sin, in the sense that Sinara, the archery term, of falling short of the mark. You're meant to, I guess. You're meant to aim high, so you get to reach a level that you were probably going to be capable of achieving. But aim higher than you think you can. Try and be a better person than you think you're capable. Try and think higher of other people than you think they're capable of being. When they fall short, they reach uh, the level they were going to achieve. And you reach that same level too. But don't just aim at what you think you can aim at because we all fall short of what we're aiming for. So we then lesser our capacities and lesser what we think other people are capable of too. And we lessen our humanity. And maybe that leads to shame too. So I believe in sin in the sense that we fall short of the mark, but I don't believe in original sin. Actually, if anything, I believe in original blessing and we fall short of that original goodness, that original blessing all the time. And I feel guilt, appropriate guilt, when I fall short of what, of my ideal. But I don't feel shame, or I rarely feel shame. I can't. To say I don't feel shame isn't true. I attempt to, uh, and when I do, then I've got to not feel shame about falling short there as well, if you like. I, I strive not to. I need to find space where I can share and get back into right relationship. And you can't do that alone, I don't think. And sometimes I fail to recognise the divinity in my brothers and I just see all where, where they're wrong. But that's good. All for the good, really, that we recognise these aspects of ourselves. Because it saves us from becoming too pious, doesn't it? For, and that's the worst thing of separating ourselves from brothers and sisters. Isn't that what Jesus was complaining about the Pharisees all the time? You know, the story of the Pharisee was exalting himself and the tax man who was humbling himself. The, the, the Pharisee saying all the great things he's doing and the, and the humble tax man. And he who's closer... To the kingdom, does Jesus say, well, the, not certainly not the pious holy man, the humble one who is open to something more, open to aim higher. We need to develop empathy. So it can be used in good purpose in this, our world. Empathy is the key and the key and, and the thing is to bring empathy to life and to act upon our empathy. You know, to, to create active empathy 
an active empathy is about opening our whole being to other people, really. We do this by not forcing ourselves upon them, but by allowing them to be themselves around us. This is true openness. This is invitational spirituality, if you like, invitational living. When I say come as you are, exactly as you are, this is what I mean. When I also say, but do not expect to live in exactly the same condition. I'm talking about religious or spiritual experience, that, that potential for transformation, that we can grow into something more. I'm not suggesting that we need to change because we're fundamentally wrong, though. More that we can become who we are wholly, and at the same time in doing so, shining our light again, if you like, we invite others to do the same. The key, it seems, is empathy. But it's more than just feeling. Active empathy, creating something from that, that, that feeling of connection, of feeling with one another, living by heart. But shame is something else. Shame is destructive and it keeps us separate from ourselves and from each other and from God. Shame is not formed from our actions or our inactions, but it comes from a darker place in our being. It's that place that people have tapped into throughout human history, really. They preyed on those aspects of our humanity. Religion being a classic, classic example, the concept of original sin, I would say, is an example of that, tapping in to that sense that we all have at times. But the secular world is just as guilty. Advertising is a classic example. How they sell us a lifestyle so that we can transcend what we see as the misery of our own existence, that we can buy something better, or at least better than our neighbour. But however bad we feel, at least we're not them. Eh? How many people suffer from a sense that there's something fundamentally wrong with them? It's crippled me at times in my life, I can assure you. But it, it doesn't so much now. Very rarely do I get those real feelings that lead me to rejecting humanity and life. When I look myself in the eye, honestly, these days, what I see is a man who gets things wrong from time to time. And you know what? I feel appropriate guilt for this. Done it several times this week. Did it this morning. Although actually that was more. Anyway, did it this morning. Leave it there. The very fact I can recognise it and acknowledge it and begin again in love enables me to act positively in this world I love. I wish I could do more. But it's not for me to do more. I am one. My, it's my task, if anything, to encourage others to do more with me. These days I feel far less shame about my being, but I must confess that I am not completely free of this 100%, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, year into decade, etc. And maybe it's important that I don't completely, because maybe then that would stop me feeling empathy or be a barrier to it. It's part of me, this, these feelings, and I'm okay with that. Why, you may ask? Well, because such feelings keep me grounded, for I know that every single one of us lives with these feelings. And knowing this helps me to develop more empathy for everybody else too, and for myself, actually. So when you look at yourself deeply into the eye, tell me what do you see? Do you see a decent person who makes mistakes or do you see someone who's fundamentally wrong, fundamentally flawed, fallen, if you like, at the core of their being? It's important what you see. It matters, you know, it really, really does, for it will affect how you interact with the world and how the world interacts with you. So let's recognise these feelings within ourselves and begin to understand these feelings within others too. Develop active empathy and invite others to do the same. And in so doing, we will live lives of love and purpose and encourage others to do the same. I'm going to end with a bit of Mary Oliver, her, her, perhaps her classic of all classics, The Wild Geese, or Wild Geese, sorry, by Mary Oliver. Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. 
You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the suddenly clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, geese harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. An active empathy allows us to feel like we belong to the family of things, because we do. So I'm going to end with some final words of blessing. You know, we need to bless more, and we can all bless. And we bless when we give ourselves wholeheartedly to life. So many days may we share life together, and flower and flow with all that is and was and ever shall be. Let us bless life through our thoughts, our words and our deeds and it will, and it will bless us in return. And may the love of God go with us all and may God's love do so in all that we feel, in all that we think, in all that we say, in all that we do. Go in love, go in peace. Amen.